God is good, amen? amen? It shouldn't scare you, really. One, you're in the church. Uh, <clears throat> two, it's something that every man and woman's going to face if the Lord tarries. But somewhere in here, some man just looked at his wife and said, Gretchen, in two minutes, you and the kids get up and go to the bathroom, and in three minutes, y'all meet me in the parking lot. <laughs> we... I don't know if there is aggression in here. If it is, I apologize. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we're here for more of you. We're here to receive your word, which is the only truth we ought to live by. You're in control, Father, and I pray in the precious name and the blood of your son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that I not be seen nor heard this morning, but you would be seen and heard working through me. That we would experience you together as a family this morning. Father, that we, we have fun this morning in your word, but we, we take to heart the seriousness of what we're about to discuss in your scriptures. Something that every man, woman, and child must come to terms with on whether or not we're willing to die to self. Are we willing to truly die to sin? And every piece, every morsel of sin. Or are we only willing to give up certain parts of it? And so, Father, I pray that our hearts and our minds and our ears be open, that we be attentive to your word, understanding fully by the power of your Holy Spirit what you have for us today. So use us, God, for your glory. And I pray that this be a visual and this be a word that we never forget from this day forward for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, may this be a standard that we set for ourselves from this day forward. In the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, all God's children said together, Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. Amen. Oh, throughout the past eight years or so, you know I like to bring props in. And when I spoke to the local funeral director and told him what I was doing, I said, how much do I owe you? He said, you preaching a message like that, it's free. We'll drop it off and pick it up. No charge. Yeah pretty neat. Uh, when your faith is sound and secure, this shouldn't scare you. Because the way I see that box that sets before you and me is, that's just the last step I got to take in order to get to where I'm working for. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll tell you what verse in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Raise your hand in the air if you remember years ago when I preached on the well and we built the well. Raise your hand if you remember the well. Were you here for that one? Okay, hands down. Do you remember the, the rod and the staff? Brother Jonathan Lohman built the rod and the staff. Raise your hand if you remember that message, rod and the staff. Amen, hands down. Do you remember the big tacky crown I built we hung from the ceiling in elementary school? Raise your hand if you remember that thing. Yeah. All right, hands down. Don't make fun of me, just hands down. <clears throat> you know, my, my prayer is, my prayer is, is that for the rest of our lives, we remember this right here. Every time we go to slip up in a moment of sin, we remember what Scripture says about being dead to sin. Alive to who? Christ. Dead to sin. See, the problem that, the problem that a lot of Christians have, and I would venture to say most, the problem that most Christians have is, is that when they read the text, dead to sin, they don't understand that the author is, the writer is speaking of all of sin, not just the sin that you're willing to give up. Amen? Tell your neighbor, you got to put it all in the box. Uh, you got you to get rid of all of it. And, and when you bury someone, you don't bury them with intent of digging it back up, do you? And so when you bury your sin, you should not be looking forward on Wednesday to digging it up on Thursday or Friday or Saturday. Amen? That when the OU goes down... The OU is supposed to stay what? Down. It's supposed to stay down. 
Now, just to keep your mind focused and off of silliness, there's nobody go pop out of this box, I promise. I've already been asked multiple times. No one's coming out. Don't, don't, don't focus on here. Focus on the word. This is just a visual to get you to understand how serious it is that God calls us to die to sin. And sin is not a game. And if you're willing to treat sin as a game, then it is surely willing to lure you away from true life in Christ. Sin is nothing to be played with, church. And I pray that today, as we go through the Word of God together, that every one of us take heed to this warning call of God. That we're to die to it. Not play with it. So, 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, in the 17th verse, the Word of God says this. Praise you, Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is the what, church? The old has what? Behold, the new has come. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's read it out loud on the count of three. One, two, three. Hey, hey, listen, I hope, I hope in the name of Jesus that as you read 2 Corinthians 5.17 and you see this box up here, that from now on you get a new understanding that the old you has supposed to have already passed away. Dead to it. See, at, at funerals, we get so serious because it is one of the only times as people that live that we have to be faced with death. And rightfully so. But I'm telling you today that we have to get that same seriousness. We have to get that same pull on this thing of sin that we should be dead to it. It should no longer have an effect over me and you because at salvation there should be a desire birthed and a strength given by the power of the Holy Spirit and it's our job to receive that strength but we have the will to want to get rid of it. Not still play and dabble in both lives. It gets you nowhere but worse off than when you first begun. Nowhere than worse off than where you first begun. You see, God takes us from a life of unrighteousness to a life of righteousness in Christ, church. But we, but we must be willing to give up the old way of living in sinful and lustful behaviors. We must be willing to give up all of the things that keep us from growing in our relationship with Almighty God. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. And Paul writes that we are to do the following. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Matter of fact, turn there if you have your Bibles. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24. Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. Ephesians 4, 22, the Word of God says this, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. Everybody say former life. See, you can't be going back and forth if you want to be blessed in the righteousness of God. You can't be tampering with the old you because the old you is supposed to be in the box. And you're not called to dig it up. You're not called to resurrect it up just because it's a party weekend. It's supposed to stay dead. And that's serious business. The former way of life is serious business. Everybody look up here for a moment, please. The former way of life is serious business because before you got saved in Jesus Christ, that former life was carrying you straight to hell. It was carrying me straight to hell 
the former life is serious business, church. And look at what the writer, look at what he says. Look at what Paul says right here. Verse Ephesians 4, 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. There's nothing good about that. Verse 23. And to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And to put on the what, church? New self. And to put on the new self, created created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Look at verse 24, because actually go to verse 23. 23 is when, the, when it's talking about the good stuff in the new you. 22 is talking about the old you that you're no longer supposed to have. It's your former manner of life. So once we buried the old man, once we buried the old woman, the old way of living, look at verse 23 says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self. Watch this. As we put on the new self, verse 24 says that we are created after the likeness of who? God. We're created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Understand what's going on here, church. When we die to our old self, when we die to our old sin, we are renewed in the new self through a real personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? This is how we're renewed. But listen, church, every one of us, every one of us, according to this passage of Scripture, every one of us was created to be in the likeness of God. Every one of us was created to be in the likeness of God, which means living a life of righteousness and living a life of holiness, church. And we cannot do that without the Spirit of God living and working and operating inside of us every day of our lives. Amen. You and I, we cannot be holy on our own, but you and I can only be holy and righteous in Christ. You say, Pastor, that's too hard to adhere to. That's, that's too hard for me to sit here and, and fathom the fact that, that you're asking me to die to my sin. But listen, it's not that hard when you bury the old you and just never deal with it anymore. You say, well, that's impossible. I'll always be tempted. I didn't say you'll never be tempted. I just said, bury the old you. Bury the old you. Isn't it something how we can end relationships and have nothing to do with the person ever again? But as Christians, we don't get the mind wrapped around the fact that we can end the relationship with the old us, never to have anything to do with it again. That's how serious it is, church. You see, if you want to get rid of the OU, you have to stop carrying around the, whip the weapons of, of sinful warfare that calls you to self-destruct time and time again. And when you, when you bury the old you, you do it with the intent to never go dig it back up again. It's done. It's gone. It's over. Some people, church, some people even in church desire to bury their old lifestyle only with hopes to, be, to, to, to go and dig it back up when it seems or deems itself warranted or necessary. Because you're hanging out with a certain group of people that you used to hang out with before you got saved, and so now you feel as though you need to act like they act before you got saved. Tell your neighbor, just let it go already. Yeah. Just let it go already. It's serious business. You see, if the old you and the old me had us on a track straight to hell before we received Jesus Christ as Savior, then don't you understand that that's what Satan wants to continue to operate in to pull you away from your faith is the old you? The old you. And we have to be careful. We have to be conscious of what's going on. Go to Colossians chapter 3 for me, church. Colossians chapter 3. Go just a couple books over. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at the first verse and see what it says about this death. See, most people just see death as the end to this life, <clears throat> but we're to die to some things before we get to that point, amen? Colossians chapter 3, look at the first verse, please. And the Word of God says this, praise the Lord. If then you have been raised with Christ... 
seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Did you hear that, church? Verse 3, for you have what? It's not talking about a physical death, is it, church? God bless you. It's not talking about a physical death, is it, church? No. He's talking to the church already that is still living on this earth, and he says, for you have died. What's it talking about? What is he talking about that they died to? Anybody know? Your whole ways. Look, look, look at it. Look at it. Verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen, church? Put to death. Everybody say, just kill it. Just kill it, man. Just, just kill it. You, are, you need to understand the severity. I'm telling you, just kill the old you. You, you got to get, you gotta get rid of it. It, it is what is hindering so many people. It is what is tripping up so many folks. And, and maybe you just don't understand the magnitude of it. Maybe you just don't understand the seriousness of it. Maybe you don't understand that you can be free from it today. Verse 3. For you have died and your life is hidden with, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And don't you love it when God don't leave you hanging? He even lists some stuff. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is what, church? It's coming. Someone says, oh, gosh, Pastor Lee, this is a heavy message. You better believe it is. It has to do with your soul. And I don't take that lightly. your soul we're talking about here. Verse 7. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Tell your neighbor you got some stuff to put in the box. Oh yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Some of you got multiple things in those two lists right there. Uh, let's, go, let's, let's, let's go through them again. And we're not going to point any fingers other than to ourselves. Amen? Yeah, because all sin and fall short of the glory of who? God. Okay? Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore. I mean, listen to the, listen to the language. Put to death. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, covetousness, get that out, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Verse 7, in these you too once walked when you were living in them. Verse 8, but now you must, what church? But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the what? Old self with its practices and have put on the what, church? New self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Do you remember we just read, we just read just a moment ago that we are made in the likeness and in the image of God? And here we're told again that, uh, look at verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator? Verse 11, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all, and what church? And all. Look at the third verse again. Paul writes, for you've died, and your life 
is hidden with Christ in God. You've died. When the old me tries to rise up in my flesh and tries to pull me back to things that I used to do before I got saved, I have to remind myself, I've already had that funeral once. You're dead, man. You're dead. Get out of here. It's serious business. See, it's, it's serious business that the old me wants to continue to attack me to pull me out of what I believe. Do you understand that? It's serious business. And in my heart and in my mind and everything that I have, I'm so excited that from this day on, God willing, the Holy Spirit will remind me of this box that stands right here in front of me. And every time Satan tempts, every time his evil workers and evil minions send a temptation, whenever my flesh uh, gets tempted, whenever I'm tested, I pray that that box pops up into my mind and I remember I'm dead to that old man. I'm dead. See, I don't, I don't have these issues, but uh, this particular issue, but maybe some people in here have an issue with, with drinking with the buddies and foolishness arises. Then you get loose in your obscene talk. I pray that you remember this next time you get a call to go hang out and you say, I, I, as much as I want to, I'm dead to that. Maybe, maybe some of you in here struggle with abusive language to your wives or to your husbands. I pray that from this day forward, you remember that box right there and you think, I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. Maybe some of you in here are struggling with drugs. I pray from this day forward, in the name of Jesus, I call down a healing and deliverance on every one of you that face that problem. And from this day forward, I pray that every time a dealer calls you or you're tempted to call a dealer, you remember that box right there and you think in the name of Jesus, I'm supposed to be dead to that old man. I'm supposed to be dead to that old woman. Every time an evil desire or a selfish thought or a wicked way rises up to tempt you in the mind, I pray that you think of that box right there and you think, I'm dead to that old person. It's serious stuff. That we are, we are engaged in a, in a warfare that has to do with life and what's the other side that not many people like to talk about? Death. Sure, it's easy for pastors to get in front of people and preach life. But there is another side for those that don't choose life, and it's death. And, and the only way that every, every Christian receives life is first through death. What's the word say? Unless a kernel of wheat fall into the earth. And what? Die. Then there be no fruit from the seed. This thing on death is so pivotal to victorious living in Christ. It is pivotal. How many of you know by show of hands that you, there are times where you have to die daily? And, and how many of you can testify, for those that don't know that, that there's some times that you have to die to self multiple times in a day? And that's not always easy, is it? But it becomes easier every day that we understand that it is a battle. See, jot this down if you're, if you're taking notes, please. Verse 5, Colossians 3, 5. Paul writes, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Everybody look at it, because there's something that you have to do here, and that I have to do here. Colossians 3, look at Colossians 3, verse 5. Paul writes, what's the first three words? <laughs> yeah. Everybody say, put to death. Say it again. One more time. All right, listen to this. Listen to what he's talking about here. He's not talking about killing an enemy. Look at what he's talking about. He's talking about you and me. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. He's talking to the church, not just as a group, as a body, but as individuals. 
And that means that you and I have work. And when I read this, when I read this verse this morning, a revelation just, just went off in my soul. The severity of what Paul is saying. He says, put to death in you. And I pray that you receive this in the same way that the Holy Spirit gave it to me because it's so sweet. The Word of God is so sweet. He said, put to death. That means, whose job is that? Mine or God's? Mine. Who gives me the power to slay it? God. But whose job is it to get to want to get rid of it? I've counseled Christians throughout the years that just wonder why they're struggling, wonder why they're struggling, wonder why they're struggling, and they just don't understand that God gives you the power, but he's not going to remove it You've got without you having the will for it to be removed. You've got to want to put it to death. Look at it again, verse 5. First three words. What does it say, church? That's serious business. Some of us in here have things today that need to be left in that box. Some of us in here have areas in our lives that just need to be put to death. Some of us in here maybe even have friendships and relationships that just need to be put to death right now. Because it is what is literally pulling you away from your relationship in Christ. And there's no friendship worth that if you ask me of my personal opinion. See, my relationship with Christ is first. It comes before my wife. It comes before myself. It comes before my children. It comes before this ministry. If I don't have it right with Christ, I'm no good for nobody else. Amen? Put to death. <laughs> look, look at it again, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly. And then it even gives a position. It gives a position. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly where? In you. Tell your neighbor, just let it go already. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly that is in you. Jot this down if you're taking notes. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says this. Paul says, Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives, gives it a position, in what? See, when you were crucified and you took that cross up the hill, everybody knew you weren't coming back. Amen? And so when, when, when Paul says in Galatians 2.20 that I've been crucified with Christ, that means that the old me has already what? Died. But I love the position that he gives because just like we just, like we just read in Colossians, he says that the, the, uh, to put to death the things that are earthly uh, by nature and that are in you, okay, things that are earthly and that are in you, here's the, here's the position Paul says in Galatians uh, 2.20. He says, look, we've been crucified with Christ. That means we should have died already, Amen. The old me should have died already, but then he gives, he gives a new position. He says, but we are alive in who? Christ. Look at it, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, I've already died, but it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 1 Peter 2.24. Put that on the screen, please. 1 Peter 2.24, jot that down if you're taking notes. 1 Peter 2.24 says this, speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. See, when you begin to see the upside to all of the death, you understand that this thing called death in the old you is good news. <laughs> Amen? Hallelujah. It's good news that I'm called to die to my old ways and now I get to live in Christ and Christ live in me and I'm living in the righteousness of God. That's good news. I mean, think about it. Every person in here, we need to ask ourselves this question. Would I rather live in the flesh, <coughs> excuse me, would I rather live in the flesh 
and be in damnation for all eternity? Or would I rather die to self right here and live in glory forever? That's the severity of it. I mean, let's say in a good long life, you live to be 90 years old. I don't want to take nothing from you. Let's say 120. I don't want to get crazy and shortchange nobody. <clears throat> My family had a great, great grandmother. How old did she live to be, Pop? Two of them. What was the other one? Another one hit 100, didn't it? 99 and a half on my other side. So on one side, I, I had a great, great, great grandmother. I think is how far, maybe one more great. She lived to be 116. And uh, on my mom's side, I had one li lived to be 99 and a half. And I don't know that I want to go that long in this old suit. Uh, but I think at over 100, she was still carrying water up the hill from the well. At 108. At 108 years old, she was still carrying water up the hill. Now, you want to know why she lived to be 108? Because she was uh, 116? Because she was still carrying water up the hill. The woman was still working, man. <laughs> so if we live to be 116, what good is it to gain the world and lose your soul? I'd rather lose the world and gain everything that God has for me here on this earth. And in order to do that, I got to die to myself. Every day I wake up. Some of you, when you got here this morning, said, oh, pastor, you look sharp this morning because normally I don't wear this old uncomfortable tie. And I responded to those people, oh, I got to go to a funeral today. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry. So who's in the casket? I am. Every day I wake up, I need to remind myself of that box. And I need to remember that today I'm dying to sin. Today I'm dying to self. I have a Lord that died for me and I live because he lives. And now, now that I've died to self, my Lord lives in me. And I am him. And you know what is so freeing about that? It takes all the weight off of my shoulders when I realize that I'm going to potentially be attacked today and I've already admitted to myself that I know it's coming and if it comes, I'm not falling to it, but I'm standing strong in Christ. It is so burden-free living. It is so, uh, such a weight has already been lifted off your shoulders. And if you know me personally, I'm a last-minute type of dude. It drives my knife, uh, my knife, my wife nuts. Got those two words mixed up. It drives my wife nuts. Because right up to today, we were supposed to, until the rain came, we were supposed to have a, a spring festival. And she asked me a week ago, when are we going to start planning? And I said, well, probably Thursday or Friday. And she said, but it's Sunday. And I said, I know, but today's Monday. And she said, yeah, but we got to start getting stuff lined up. I said, we'll do that Thursday or Friday or maybe Friday and Saturday. And she's an organizer, man. And do you know how, how nuts that drives an organizer? And I'm not saying she's wrong. I'm just telling you I'm right. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I love saying that. I said it at Bible study the other night, and too many people were in there that don't know me, and I think it rubbed them wrong, but that's okay because it's all right. God is in control. But let me tell you what I'm thinking. Today's Monday, and somebody might call for a funeral. Somebody might call for a wedding. Somebody might call, God forbid, for a hospital visitation. Somebody might get in a car accident, God forbid. There's just so many things that Monday comes with to take my mind and throw it into Sunday that I can't even see. I, I, can, see, I can see Monday because I'm in it, but Sunday. We're, now, if I'd have wasted all my week planning on Sunday and it rained anyway, I told you I was right. All that wasted time planning. I love you. 
You, you just think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Do you do you reckon do you reckon that that's why the word says don't worry about worry about because today has enough what? See, and so when I wake up tomorrow, I got to die to the old man again tomorrow. But I can't worry about dying to the old man next week because there's an old man trying to fight me today that I need to conquer today in the name of Jesus. Yo, you're a pastor. You're still fighting the old you? Absolutely. And because of it, I'm probably fighting them 10 times stronger than what I would be if I wasn't. When you wake up in the morning, you have to physically and mentally remember the old me is done today. I'm giving my habits up today. And what I've experienced with people that are giving up addictions is this. So many times they fail because they see their, they see their victory process as having to be forever. Don't look at it as trying to battle that thing forever. And sooner or later, that's why you'll succumb to it every time. You wake up thinking, today's the day that I'm free from this problem, and I just have to be free from today until I go to bed in the name of Jesus. And you beat that thing today. And then, and then when tomorrow gets here, today's the day. I've got new joy this morning, and I'm not trying to beat this thing for the next 50 years of my life. I'm just going to beat it today. See, when people try to beat something for the rest of their lives, you don't have enough strength to get through the next two days, much less forever. God gives me enough for today. I don't know that I'm going to be here tomorrow. But he's given me what I need for when? Today. And so I encourage you, as you pray for your deliverance and you trust in God and your healing and your miracle, you just start fighting with what you've been equipped to fight with And it will be a lot less overwhelming to your soul. You got to put stuff in the box today. Because I guarantee you tomorrow you got to put some more stuff in the box. I guarantee you. You know, the old saying is, is that you can't take it all what? With you. Heard that for years. I've done more funerals than I can remember to count. From as young as two weeks old to elderly, elderly, elderly. Praise God. And one day driving down Interstate 95, this is the truth, I came across this brand new Cadillac hearse. Beautiful, beautiful black hearse. And behind the hearse, they had a hitch. It was hitched up to one of them small six-foot U-Haul trailers. And I said to myself, I guess he's taking it with him. <laughs> oh, man. You can't take anything with you other than your soul. See, this is, this is, what, this is what I'm getting to is, Stop, stop, trying to, stop trying to save certain things that you like that keep you uh, farther away or keep you in a distance, uh, uh, distant relationship with God. Stop trying to keep the sins that you enjoy but only willing to give up the sins that are easy to give up. How about getting up some hard stuff because Christ gave up the hard stuff. He gave up his life. And what kind of relationship is that? What, well, what kind of relationship is it when he laid it down, uh, when he laid down all of it and you're just willing to give up the easy part of it? But he so desires, church, and this is beautiful. This is the beautifulness of Christ. He, he so desired to give it all, and he did give it all, and he, and, and he just requires the same thing of us, not on our own behalf, but by the strength that he gives us. That's so beautiful that I don't have to fight this, this, this thing on, on, on my own. The only thing that I'm called to have is the will to want to get rid of it. And do you understand, and if you don't, you need to understand, that as long as you're just willing to get rid of the OU, God's got the rest. He will empower you. He will strengthen you. He will heal you. He will deliver you. He will give you the word that you need to have fresh and anew every day as you delve into his word with him in intimacy and a personal relationship in praise and prayer and worship and listening and communicating. God will give you every strength, every word, everything that you'll ever need 
You just have to be responsible enough to be willing to receive. And that does, church, that does take a huge heap of responsibility on our behalf. 1 Peter 2.24 again. 1 Peter 2.24. Peter says, uh, talking about Jesus, he, Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And listen, church, when it talks about dying to sin, it means how much of sin? All of it. So my question to every one of us, including myself, including myself this morning, is this. Is it all in the box or is it not? Have I died to all of it or have I died to just some of the old me? See, I know there will be moments when we will find ourselves falling short of the glory of God. That's coming. That's coming. I don't want you to hear this word and think that because you're imperfect, you can't live up to a perfect standard. Without Christ, there's none of us that can live up to that standard. Amen? But the good news is, is that in Christ Jesus we can. And when we find ourselves falling short of the glory of God, it is so detrimental that we immediately begin asking in repentance for forgiveness. Not enjoying the old man just because we've already begun to commit the sin. Seeing what I am saying is this, is that if we cannot be willing to give up certain sin in our lives with hopes of holding on to other sins because our flesh enjoys it, we have to be willing to open the box and put even the good stuff in. How many of you, how many of you can just be real and acknowledge that sin feels good? Doesn't it? It does. Yes, it does. But you know what's going to far outweigh that? How many of you know that the word of God says you're heirs of Christ? And you got something coming far better than what you need to be putting down into this box anyway. And there's going to be a day, hallelujah, where I'm going to put on a new body, and you're going to put on a new body. And you think, you think stuff that pleases, uh, pleases this flesh is good stuff? Good gracious, wait till we get in heaven with our new heavenly bodies, and we experience the fullness of Christ in the spiritual realm. Eye has not seen, ear has not what? Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've got to remind ourselves that because we are in a battle. Most churches fall asleep at the wheel because people never remind them that they're in the midst of a fight. It is a battle for your soul raging on. Pastor, even when I get saved, even more so when you get saved. Even more so when you get saved. The way I see it is this, is that as long as you're lost and dying and going to hell, Satan ain't going to interrupt that process. But when you allow Christ to step in front and lead you into a promised land, that's when he begins to get upset. How many of you know it's good news when you make the devil ticked off? Yes, it is. <laughs> what do you tell what did he tell the guys? Peter, I know. Remember the demon spoke? And, and, and they whipped up on the boys. You guys remember that? Not the disciples, just some other guys. And he says, Peter, I know. I hope and pray. This may sound crazy to you, but this is just where I'm at. I hope and pray that the enemy knows my name. And I pray, not because of who I am, but because of what God does in me, that they shudder when they hear it. That's not boastful thinking. That's not prideful thinking. But if I do boast, I boast in Christ and Christ alone. I know who my God is, and I know that there's no enemy that can come up against me and prevail. And even if an enemy take my flesh, he cannot overcome my soul. We're on the winning team if you're saved. We are on the winning team if you're saved, church. Think about this. Luke. Chapter 9, 23. If we can get that on the screen, please, gentlemen. God bless you. I thank you. Jot it down if you're taking notes. Luke 9, 23. Go ahead and turn there. Go ahead and turn there.
Luke chapter 9, verse 23. God is so good, amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. This excites me. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him what to himself? Let him deny himself. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. How many people in here can acknowledge that we've got some denying of selves to do? I'm right there with you. Before today's over, I'm going to have to deny myself of something. And when tomorrow starts, God willing, we see it, you're going to have to deny yourself of some things. And when you start your day off acknowledging that, you stay on guard for that. As scripture says, as on a watchtower. You know, when they, when they fortified their cities in the Bible, you read a lot about it in the Old Testament, when, uh, when they fortified their cities, their walls would have watchtowers. Church, what were the watchtowers for? Yeah, they were watching out. Who were they watching out for? Yeah, it wasn't for the pizza man showing up in 30 minutes or less. I wonder when he's, he, he got 10 more minutes, and this is free. This is free. The word says pay the man what he's due, and some of you probably hoping that he's late. You got the piece to get a man the money. But anyway, watchtower, that we're to look out. And the reason many Christians fall is because they didn't climb up on the watchtower. Remember, according to what the word said, we've already read it twice in just a matter of a few minutes that we've been sitting in here. You got some things that you got to do for yourself in order for the activation of God's process to kick in for you. You got to want it for yourself. But you put to death the misdeeds in the earthly nature. God will equip us, but we've got to be willing to slay the dragon, if you will. We've got to be willing to want to get rid of it. Amen? So let's look at what he says right here. Uh, back, back to what Jesus is saying. Luke 9.23. If anyone, if anyone, everybody hear that? Is anyone in this room, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and do what, church? Follow me. See, this is a daily deal here. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily, church. Daily, we have to deny self because daily we will face temptation to please our flesh. Look at someone near you and say, choose this day to let it all go. Yep, find somebody else. Choose this day to let it all go. Now tell yourself, I'm going to choose this day to let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God a clap of praise because he's worthy? <laughs> Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Uh, turn there with me, please, church. Romans chapter 6, choose ye this day what God you will serve. But as for me and my what, we will serve who? I tell you, I don't know why, but more scripture has been coming to me in the process of giving scripture than what I've ever been receiving for years in preaching in this church. Have you noticed that? I keep quoting scripture. I don't know if you've noticed that, but in my spirit, it just keeps... It just, just, keep, just keeps being fed to me. Uh, I'm, I'm just telling you, you've got to understand the severity of the death process of the old you. He can't or she can't keep living in your life no more. The old you is trying to ride you away from a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're in here and you've never asked Jesus to save your soul, it's that you that is trying to keep you away from Christ. The flesh selfishness, the sin of a man and woman. But the good news is, is that Jesus just said, for anyone. Amen? For anyone. Doesn't matter how bad you've been, how low you've gone, anyone can call on the name of the Lord to be saved in the name of Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 6, look at the first verse. Romans 6, the word of God, praise the Lord, is so good, glory to God. It says this, praise the Lord. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? What's it say with an exclamation point in verse 2? <clears throat> ah, just get rid of it. By no means. How can we who died to sin still what? Isn't that good? Isn't God's word so good? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And what's the opposite of life? <laughs> you see the, severi the, the severity of this? Life and death. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And we were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, it should not be grieving for you to let go of the old you, because when you let go of the old you, there's fullness and newness of life in Jesus Christ. See, the good thing is about getting rid of old you, and there's now a void in your life, there's an open space, the good news is, is that that's more room for God to do work in you. And that's never a bad deal. Verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him in a, death, in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Amen? We know that our old self was what? Crucified with him in order that the body of sin, watch this, the body of sin might be brought to what? Nothing. Tell your neighbor, that's all of it. Yeah, but, but even this, yes, even that. Yeah, but even just a little bit of weed, yes, just a little bit of weed. Yeah, but what about just on my birthday? All of it. Nothing. Go to verse 6 again. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be what? Enslaved to what? See, when Christians realize the seriousness of sin, we got Christians walking around as slaves who don't even know that they're in bondage. And they don't understand why they're not feeling good. They don't understand why they don't have victory. They don't understand why they're struggling all the time. They don't understand why they're down in the dumps all the time. Look, I'm going to give you the answer right now according to the Word of God. And from this point on, you're accountable for what you hear from the Word of God. The reason is because, is because you're enslaved to sin. You're in bondage, and you don't have to be. Now, that should be good news for everyone in this room, including myself. You don't have to be in bondage any longer. But you got to be willing to put to death the deeds of this earth. You say, Pastor, how do I let go of being an alcoholic? Pastor, how do I let go of emotionally or physically abusing my wife or myself? Pastor, how do I let go of cursing all the time? Pastor, how do I let go? You just have to be willing to put it to death. And then God does the rest. But until you have a desire to kill it, it don't have to go nowhere. It don't have to go nowhere. Look at verse 7. For one who has died has been what? So when you die to yourself tomorrow, Set free. Set free. How freeing is that? See, I'm praying that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that this is such a fresh word for everyone in this room that you've been struggling with, maybe even bad thoughts of yourself, maybe depression, maybe, maybe thoughts of unworthiness. And, and all I'm telling you is that if you're, willing, if you're willing to just be done with that, then you can be set free. And you, if you're sitting here and you're, you're arguing with the fact that you can, and you say, well, it's not that easy. Yes, it is. You've just never let it been that easy. It is that easy because the Word of God says you just must be willing to put it to death. So 
some people want to get free desperately from things, but they're not willing to kill it. Everyone look up here because I feel led in the spirit to say this. Wanting to be free and wanting to destroy it are not the same thing. Everybody with me? God bless you. Wanting to be free and the desire to kill it are not the same thing. Was it Paul that says, I know what I should do, but that ain't what I do do. And what I know I shouldn't do, that is what I do. See, it's a difference between wanting and doing. But when we can bring the do along with the want, then you go find God in the midst of it. Then you go find God all up in the mix. Verse 8. Now if we have what? Y'all didn't, didn't know the word die was so many times in the New Testament, did you? <laughs> now we have died with Christ. We believe that we will also, here's good stuff, what is it? Live with him. Amen? Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Amen, church? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Verse 10. For the death he died, he died to what? Sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And so you also, everybody say, me too. So you also, verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves what? And alive in who? So you also must consider yourselves dead in sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a good word. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to what? Life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under what? I can honestly look at you in this very present moment right now and in the moment I'm living in. And again, I'm not perfect. But in the moment I'm living in right now, I can look at you and say, sin has no power over you. Sin has no dominion over my life. Look at your neighbor and say, sin has no power over me right now. Verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Look at verse 2. Romans 6, 2, because the second verse says this, how can we who died to sin still live in it? I guess that would mean that we really didn't die to it. Or maybe we buried it because we didn't want it, but our flesh wouldn't let us kill it, so we just went to the backyard and dug it up again in the moment of falling to the lust of the flesh. See, don't just want to get rid of the imperfection. Get rid of it. Just get rid of it. John 12, 24, jot this down, please, if you're taking notes. John 12, 24, Jesus speaking, says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. 
But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You see, church, dying to sin, dying to your old self is beneficial. Dying to the old self is strengthening. And it is an absolute must, and I repeat, an absolute must if you desire to walk in a life of obedience and righteousness. It's a must. No way around it. I'm going to close with one more passage of Scripture, and afterwards I'm going to give you a challenge from that Scripture. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4. Head all the way back to... Uh, 1 John, you'll find it back there. 1 Peter chapter 4. Our God is so good, amen. Praise the Lord. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to begin with verse 1. We're going to read for a little bit. The word of God says this, praise the Lord. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for who? The will of God. That's where I want all of our hearts to be, right there. How incredible is that, to have a church with that heart cry that we no longer live for, for human passions, but for the will of God. Imagine how every home in this church would change if the head of it was a man that had des a desire to live not for the passions of, of the human or earthly nature, but for the very will of God. Imagine the homes that would desperately be in change, that if the, if the woman of the home had a desire not to live in ways of the earth, but in the will of God. Imagine the children's lives that would grow up desperately changed. If only they had a mother and father who had, a, had an agreement to no matter how bad it gets, live in the will of God. Just yesterday I was speaking with an elementary school. No, I take that back. She was a high school teacher. Just yesterday. And she said every year, every year that they get new students into the high school, it just gets worse and worse. The behavior gets worse and worse. The obedience, uh, the disobedience gets worse and worse. And matter of fact, she just recently had a, had a student tell the teacher, well, if you want to argue with me, just argue with me. And I don't, you can curse at me. I don't care if you curse at me. And the teacher told me, you want to know why the child didn't care if I cursed at her as a teacher? Because that's what she gets at home. Imagine what would change if we had leaders that had the, 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 the heart that was after God's heart. And so here, this is exactly what it's talking about in this passage of Scripture. Let's go forward. Let's go forward. Um, verse, verse 2 again. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that this church has that heart. Verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, orgies drinking, parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the, in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. See, a day is coming. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. And though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Oh, isn't that good to be in a place like that? Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, 
keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. 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 My challenge to you today that I believe is of the Lord is found in the fourth verse. Verse 4 says this. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. See, the truth of the matter, church, is this, is that you're going to leave here today and hopefully the word of God has spurred you to the point to where you're willing to die to flesh every day for the rest of your life. You die to sin. And according to that scripture, there's going to be people that think you're crazy because you want to try to do right with everything that you've got. There's going to be people that consider you an outcast simply because you want to live a life of holiness and righteousness. And then the end of that verse says that they will malign you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to call your name, Mr. Do Good, Holier Than Thou, Holy Roller. But they did far worse to our Lord. So if he's the one we're truly after, if he's the one we're truly following in obedience, why should we expect any different? So it says that there will be some that, that are surprised and they will malign you. And as I was going before the Lord with his sermon, right in just the last couple minutes, right when I began to pray, the Lord reminded me of the movie, God's Not Dead. And how at the end of the movie, they challenged everyone to text everybody in their contact list, God's Not Dead. And it was a huge deal that was just sweeping all over the United States of America, people sharing their faith by simply sending a text with three words, God's not dead. And then as I began to pray, a scripture came to mind, and it's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So my challenge to everyone in this room is this. That before you leave this property today, or when you go home at your lunch table, your dinner table, that you would go through your entire contact list and put just a few words that says I'm dead to sin alive in Christ and then you sign off by saying Galatians 2 20 for some people in your contact list that's liable to be the only gospel that you deliver to them for some people in your contact list, they're going to be home on a rainy day with nothing to do other than to think about what the Holy Spirit just hit them with when you hit sin. We can be so quick to send messages of gossip, but fail to send messages of gospel. Imagine the impact that if someone's phone goes off today and they see it's a message from you and they open it up and it says, I'm dead to sin, alive in Christ, 
Galatians 2.20. And then that's it. Let the Holy Spirit water the seeds that you plant. And if you're sitting there today, and I know there's many of you that are thinking, well, I can't do something like that to everybody because some of them know how I'm really not a good person. Then my plea to you is, you're exactly the person that God wants to send that text. What a testimony you have to the people that know your dirt. What a testimony you have to the people that know your sin, that today you can profess that today you've died to it. Now you're alive and well. Dad, if I may, how many years clean are you from? I remember my dad before he was six years clean. I remember, and obviously I know him now, but, and nobody's perfect. But I'd far rather have that one now than I would the one seven years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. So the reason I bring that up is as a testimony that no matter what you're struggling with today, no matter what you're struggling with, don't be ashamed of letting the people in your list know I'm dead to that. What a testimony. You have the ability today to shape the lives of everybody in your list. All you have to do is throw a seed and the Holy Spirit has the ability to shape the lives of everyone that you throw it into. Let's stand and pray. You know, if you want to send a picture text in your text and you want to, you want to come up here and take a selfie in front of the box. That'd be cool too. What a conversation starter. I'm totally fine with that. Seriously. How cool, guys, listen. How cool would that be, fellas? How, how, how wide of a door would that swing open at work tomorrow, man? It'd be pretty wide open, wouldn't it? Why not? So I'm normally here to 1 o'clock every Sunday, so no matter how long the procession is, I'll be here. The only thing I ask is, is that it looks wood, and it very, way may, very may well be, but the edges are so sharp that the, the, the gentleman who delivered it here cut his arm on it. So please be careful. Please. But feel free to come take a picture with it dead to sin, man. Alive in Christ. Galatians 2.20. Look it up. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. You are great. You are great. And you sent your son, Jesus, our Lord, to die and to take on my sin? Who am I to live in it any longer? I pray that every day we wake. Every day we wake. be willing to die to self so that we can faithfully serve you 
without getting in the way. God, I pray that where we've been tripping our own selves up, you would give us revelation. I pray that everyone in this room realize that it's up to us to put to death the deeds of this earth. We've got to be willing to do that and then you supply the power and the ability. And God, I pray that as, as we send out this text message to everyone, to some it's going to be uncomfortable to hit send to. But I pray that we don't ignore or skip by anyone because those are the ones that desperately we may need to pull from the flames of hell as your word speaks of in Jude. God, I pray that every person that receives the text, that it would hit them today, and it would hit good soil. It wouldn't be rocky soil. It wouldn't be amongst the thorns. It would be good soil today. And I pray that even as this morning has gone on, that you've been preparing their minds, you've been preparing their hearts, so that the soil is ready for that seed to be cast out onto. And I pray, Almighty God, that every eye that reads those words would take heed to consider the call and the weight thereof. I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ that you would use this to start a mighty revival in the midst of your people. I pray that people realize that it's a good thing for the old us to die. Because only through death can we walk in the fullness of life. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, we ask all these things, Father, in faith. And we honor you. In Jesus' name, may we honor you in all things, Lord. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, Amen. Can we give God a clap of praise? He's worthy. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.